one of the first things a good diplomat needs to be able to do is to understand the other side so that one's responses, one's interactions and exchanges and conclusions and communiques and so on and so forth, right, reflect that. And you can actually progress. Um, not only do we not have that capacity, I think just as sadly and just as worrisome, we don't, we, Washington, doesn't seem to have any interest in developing it. This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Patrick Lawrence, who is an extraordinary writer, journalist. He is the executive editor of The Scrum. Uh, it's a column that he and our former colleague, uh, Marshall Arbach and others are involved in. He's written many books related to foreign policy, and he's written uh, some very, very powerful things in recent weeks related to China, the Ukraine, the Biden administration, and uh, Vladimir Putin. Patrick, thank you for taking the time to join me today. Well, a great pleasure, Rob, and I'm uh, very honored to you thought of me to have me on and give me some time. Very, very grateful. Well, I, how I say, you, you more than earn it. I'm the one who's fortunate here today in my view. So, well, at any rate, let's talk about... You, you had a recent article, and you cited a book from a man I once sent in on a course. When I was at MIT, I worked along with economics and engineering. I took a lot of courses in uh, arms control and disarmament, George Rathjens, Jack Ruina, Bill Kaufman, and others. And they sent me over some cross-registration to Harvard, and I did sit in on a course with Stanley Hoffman. So uh, in this context... Your, was it Primacy in World Order is the book you're citing? Yeah. That's the launching pad. Where, where, how did that inspire you and where are we going? You know, uh, it's very funny. That, that Hoffman book, uh, Primacy in World Order, was published in 1978. I was a younger man. Uh, I was an editor at the New York Times at that moment right, when it came out. One sunny afternoon in June, I remember walking into a bookshop on my lunch hour and I bought it. It's been a it's been an important book for me ever, ever since. Uh, parenthetically, uh, it's remarkable the number of people who have made comments such as your own. Oh, yes, I sat in on a Hoffman course or uh, Jamie Galbraith said, oh, he reviewed my master's thesis and you know, et cetera. Lots of people. Um, uh, look, uh, the title, uh, the title says a very great deal. It, it, uh, four words, primacy or world order. It's a rather stark binary. And, uh, and I think Hoffman meant it that way. He wrote it in 78. A lot of us were thinking three years after the, uh, some would say the fall of Saigon, I would say the rise. Uh, three years after the defeat in Vietnam, the better among us were scratching uh, their heads. What have we done wrong? Uh, how did we go wrong? Uh, where do we go from here? We ought to do things differently. The world is another kind of place now, et cetera, et cetera. These were the Carter years, basically. Right? Uh, that's when the book came out. Uh, it's 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 best understood as as a uh, a post Vietnam introspection, right? Uh, uh, and that is what he came up with. He, uh, we Americans had a choice. We could continue to pursue uh, the primacy we uh, elaborated uh, rather swiftly after the 1945 victories. Um, uh, we could continue to insist upon that, right? Uh, various ideologically driven crusades and so on. And, uh, you know, Wilsonian uh, make the world safe for democracy, the, the whole thing. Right? Uh, or we could develop what Hoffman called a world order policy. That was our choice. 
what was a world order policy? Well, one of the more interesting things he said about it was nobody can declare a world order. He didn't use the word multipolarity. I'm rather mystified. I don't, I, I can only conclude it wasn't in the lexicon at the time or something, right? Uh, but that's what he meant. And in, in a multipolar world, it, it, by definition, nobody can stand up and say, okay, here, here's, here's the world order, right? It, the, uh, a, a world order policy reflects the reality that the global order is formed one question, one conflict, uh, one interaction at a time. Uh, as my other half here said brilliantly when she was re reviewing my Hoffman column, uh, world order is not a policy, it's a process. That's what Hoffman meant, right? So that was our choice in, in brief. Um, and we made the wrong one. Uh, as I said in the column that in part brought us together, um, it's, uh, it's rather grim to reflect how pertinent Hoffman's book remains, uh, because, uh, we haven't got it done yet. We, we, um, I think for a variety of reasons, we can go into them if you wish. We simply can't don't, well, we, our leader, our, our foreign, foreign policy elites and so forth, do not seem capable of changing direction, of re-examining uh, our circumstances. Uh, they're very wedded to uh, the realities of the first uh, 50 years uh, after the 45 victories. They're not brilliant at imaginative thinking, and a new uh, a world order policy would require a lot of imagination, uh, creativity, uh, wisdom uh, of a sort that seems to be in short supply uh, uh, in Washington, and and courage. We have to do something new. That takes courage for a person. Uh, running policy in Washington, and they don't seem to have it. So there we are. You know, I, I thought that's why it was uh, pertinent to bring Hoffman's book uh, off my bookshelf and put it in front of readers. I'm very interested from the perspective that you have raised through uh, referring to Hoffman about where the obstacles are. Why can't well-educated, intelligent people in the national security apparatus of the United States see this, we might call we rather than me, approach to the design and implementation. Mm. Why a, what I'll call a co-authored world order as nice, distinct nice from an imposed world yeah. order. Uh, and I do sense from the echoes of Bismarck and others that there are times when which you might call uh, the instability at home creates mm. a, a yearning for a foreign adversary that we can all become aligned and yeah. um, united against. But there's another piece of this too, and I'll call it the Daniel Ellsberg piece. When I was taking courses at MIT and Harvard in the 70s, about the time that book came out, the notion of mutual assured destruction, Tom Schelling's game theory and everything was very prevalent. Daniel Ellsberg has written a book called The Doomsday Machine, who says, if we degenerate into a nuclear conflict, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Russia, we can destroy the upper atmosphere and all life on Earth. So the stakes are not who's got a broken arm from an arm wrestle. The stakes are related to what you might call an escalation that could lead to destruction of life on Earth. We don't even get to the climate change challenge if uh, if we induce the climate change with this with this hideous outcome that some people are terrified of right now, perhaps with some basis. Your question is why? Why can't Washington think new thoughts? It has, yes. it's a great question, multiple answers. I think number one, uh, isn't it the nature of power, the possessors of power, 
uh, are just always bound to be reluctant to surrender power. Um, they tend to think in a well-worn phrase, but per perfectly good. They tend to think in zero-sum terms. If we begin adapting to a, a world of uh, multiple poles, we lose. You know, that's part of it, too. Um, I think another part of it is nostalgia. I, I uh, one of my parents was horrifically nostalgic, right? Always remembering childhood and, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a boy and an adolescent, I, I grew extremely impatient with that, right? And, and um, I concluded, um, uh, years later that nostalgia is a form of depression, right? It, it's, uh, it reflects a, a refusal or an inability to embrace one's present. Mm -hmm. Let's get lost in the past. Right? It's kind of a, it's a reaction to fear. Yeah. I, I, uh, or uh, on, a yeah. on a personal level, it's can be an irritation or something. Right. Uh, on a national level, it's problematic. Very, it's troublesome to put the, point mildly so and and it's plain the pentagon uh perhaps most of all the pentagon uh certain factions in congress right nostalgia is uh, for nostalgia for the unchallenged uncomplicated decades after the war is very powerful they don't want you know a sort of flippant phrase uh, why do people want to pre continue pretending it's 1955, right? Uh, but that's the impression you sometimes get. So nostalgia, right? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, again, multiple answers, right? Uh, I think another one might be uh, a thought. Uh, did, uh, did Chalmers uh, share this with me long ago? I can't remember. Maybe it was mine originally. Um, for 70 years, the policy cliques in Washington did not have to think. It was just do more of the same. That's another thing power does to people. Right? Uh, we didn't need a foreign policy. And we didn't have one. We had a security policy. Right is most pronounced across the Pacific. Um, uh, Boutros Ghali, uh, who I greatly admired, uh, uh, after the United States uh, uh, arranged for his uh, ouster as Secretary General at the UN, uh, published his memoirs, and he concluded with the most delightful insight. Uh, Diplomacy is for the weak. The strong have no need for it. Right? That was our problem for a long time. We had all the power we needed, and we didn't have to think. We did had no need for diplomacy. That's another re and and now uh, the twenty first century um, demands, in one case after another, di diplomatic solutions to things often with multiple parties at the mahogany table. And we, we're sclerotic in, in this way. We're unpracticed, you know. Uh, uh, you, you know, I, I spent many, many years abroad as a foreign, as a foreign correspondent. Uh, you meet embassy people all the time. Uh, you know, so, uh, I was in Asia for most of this time, uh, New Zealand produced some excellent diplomats, right? Uh, um, sometimes Australia, some of the Southeast Asians, right? Uh, Japanese Foreign Ministry, very, you know, very sophisticated organization. The way they trained people, they had institutional memory and so forth. The quality of foreign service officers at the United States embassies, wherever they were, KL or Tokyo or wherever, was just abysmal. We really, 
we really had no, as they say, we didn't have a deep bench, right? Um, these were these were nice enough people who had no sophistication, no very little worldliness, uh, you know, with some exceptions, I have to say, of course, exceptions. Uh, but, you know, first secretary for political secretary and so on, that sort of thing. I never went to the American embassies after a time. They never had anything, anything to say, right? Uh, boilerplate. Um, and so that's a, that's part of it too. Um, sclerosis, uh, no need of diplomacy and, and there, and therefore no capability. And we're going to have to learn this. So far, we've gotten, we've gotten to the point where it's mandatory to say diplomacy first. Well, that's progress. But those are just two words. Um, and that appears to be as far as we've got so far. <laughs> well, you, you brought up uh, Hoffman and you brought up in a phrase just a moment ago, we have to learn. How does journalism and how does teaching of international relations at universities contribute to us evolving now or and what resistances are there to those two institutional forms of what you mm. might call dynamic upgrading? Uh, uh, what, what a question. Uh, I, I lecture at Colorado College you know, once uh, at spring semester every year. Mm. Um, this summer, I'll, this year I'll do it in the summer. Um, and of course, as mentioned, I was a correspondent abroad for 29 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I teach a course called Reinventing the Foreign Correspondent. It <laughs> sort of goes to your question. Right? Yes, it does. <laughs> the argument and, it, and the entire argument of the course arose from my experience in those 29 years. Almost all of them uh, among non-Western people. Right? Uh, and many of them among East Asians. Right? Uh, and, and I concluded we we have to develop the capacity uh, to see from the perspective of others. We have to dispense with we, they, right? If you read the foreign pages in the New York Times, implicit in them is a we, they, right? Uh, Self and other is the scholarly phrase for this sort of discourse, right? We don't have to agree with the, uh, whatever we are learning from the Japanese, but we need to understand it, as I say in my course, from the inside out, so we can reflect it in our in what we write. And I mention this not because I assume I'm talking to a, a uh, rooms full of correspondence. Of course, I'm not. This is something we all need to learn, right? And it's certainly something our policymakers need to learn, right? Uh, we have this U Ukraine crisis now. I, I, I see no shred, no sign, uh, no evidence whatsoever that uh, that uh, the policy people in Washington uh, are the slightest in bit interested in understanding this question from the Russian point of view. It's, uh, apart from the fact that it's unproductive, it's profoundly unprofessional. You know, uh, I think Chaz Freeman told me this. One of the first things a good diplomat needs to be able to do is to understand the other side so that one's responses, one's interactions and exchanges and conclusions and communiques and so on and so forth, right? Reflect that and you can actually progress. Um, not only do we not have that capacity, I think just as sadly and just as worrisome, we don't, we, Washington, doesn't seem to have any interest in developing it. Yeah, I'm, it's... I'm very uh, energized as I'm listening to you because I heard a podcast the other day 
from the celebrated life coach, Tony Robbins. And he mm -hmm. said, for someone to improve a relationship, you don't try to change the other person. You change your awareness of the other person. Right. So that Good. they feel seen and safe. And I thought, yeah. wow, that sounds to me like a recipe for the foreign policy you would like to see. Yeah. As, as distinct from within the family, but but it's human to human. Yeah. I I I, uh, I don't want to diminish the significance of politics and history, no. But there is a psychological dimension yes. to so many of the questions that confront us. I I drew this conclusion first in the, in Southeast Asia, watching uh, nations such as Malaysia develop, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and why they were very uneven in their development, um, incapable of absorbing uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, international assistance and so forth. It's psychological. They, I, I concluded, if people aren't ready, they're not going to get it done. You could pour all the money you want into Thailand or Malaysia or Indonesia. It's when people are psychologically prepared that they are able to move forward with with all the assistance and uh, um, advantages that may be at their disposal. Right? I, I'm so I was sometimes accused of using psychology to blot out. Uh, historical and political realities and uh, chastened by that criticism. So uh, I, I mentioned now, uh, you know, this, this psychological dimension is one dimension of, of numerous right? culture. Well, I'm always uh, resonating with the wisdom of the famous psychologist C.G. Jung. Who, uh, the tenth volume of his collected works is called Civilization and Transition, and it's about seeing three things: the nature of the conscious individual, the unconscious dimension of that individual, and the collective unconscious, and how that differs from what you might call the mechanical man optimizing and improving and always going forward and. Uh, is is very different. What we call the shadow plays a very big role. And it's not just the shadow of the other. I've also uh, I'm energized often by conversations I've had with Orville Schell. Uh, and he and uh, John DeLury wrote a book called Wealth and Power, which said that the wounds of the opium wars and the Japanese invasion in the 30s in China are creating a desire, a yearning for them to, which you might call, overcome those wounds and evolve to a place not of unilateral global leadership, but at least being in the front row once again, like what they call the Middle Kingdom. Uh, at the same time, the United States, as you've been alluding to, is coming down the tracks thinking this is our system, fall in line, adapt to our leadership. And Orwell and John really explored how with different philosophical systems, the Cartesian Enlightenment West and the, what you call Taoist or Indian philosophies, the Eastern philosophy, which are very different, how it could create the basis for misunderstanding and error. And I know Zbigniew Brzez Brzezinski gave a speech uh, 2010, 2011 in Montreal about exactly the same thing. How are we going to make a G20 cohere when the whole world is watching after the great financial crisis, doesn't believe in expertise, doesn't believe in governance, thinks things are degenerating? How are we going to put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Yeah. Hoffman's phrase, to stay with Stanley Hoffman for just sure. a moment, what a marvelous phrase, um, harmony amid cacophony, right? That, <laughs> that's what, uh, yeah. that's, yeah. that's what a, a world order policy would 
have among its core assumptions and objectives. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and I, 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 I often think um, if if we could if we could learn to consider our circumstances in new ways, we would realize that uh, uh, our uh, insistence on primacy, hegemony, if you like, uh, I'm not allergic to the word empire, uh, it, it has it, it has some very deleterious consequences. Um, number one, we are a very lonely people. Uh, if you're the hegemon, by definition, you're up there alone. Uh, number two, uh, the burdens, this pretense of primacy imposes upon us are very great, right? Uh, there are domestic consequences. I, anybody who can look out their window can see them. Uh, social disorder, infrastructure problems, and so on, right? Uh, um, uh, and also, we don't get any help in in the way we make decisions because they have to be our decisions uh, on our insistence. I, I, I sort of think sometimes, uh, pick a question, environment or whatever it may be, uh, a military question, how rich we would be, uh, 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 all we, all of us, right? Uh, if we had a, a multiplicity of voices weighing in, here's part of the solution. Look at it this way, too. And what about that, right? Uh, we, we would all be... Uh, we would all benefit greatly from that. It would be an, another kind of world, right? Uh, it would be another kind of world order in the terms we're using today. Uh, and uh, the burdens on Americans would be much lighter. It, this is why the zero-sum syndrome is so regrettable. It keeps us from even imagining these questions of multipolarity, uh, uh, harmony amid cacophony, even imagining them, uh, we're, we're so much in a posture of resistance. We never see over the hill to, to the benefits. We, again, are policy people. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting yeah. uh, dimension here that... I guess what I, what feels like to me is there is a yearning to be emulated. The American model, freedom, da 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 da, the high level principles. We want everybody to be inspired to join mm. that vision, which comes from the struggle and development of this country. But I'm I'm haunted a little bit right now. I've just finished a book by the. Uh, he lives in Singapore, but I believe was born in India. Kishore Mabubani. Oh yes. And his new book is called uh, he was 21st around Century. When I was a correspondent there. Oh. Ah. Well, he he's got a new book called 21st Century Asia. Hmm. And he's talking about these different philosophical perspectives, this need for difference, diversity, dignity, mutual respect and things. But he said what's really hard for him right now is he has a chapter and it's I think I don't remember the title but it's either the title or the subtitle plutocracy or democracy and the question he's saying is if you have something that's for and by and of the one percent in the United States is that what the rest of the world's going to be inspired to emulate mm -hmm. and yeah. he's he's actually saying if you will you got to practice what you preach and yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I know he doesn't listen to Barry White very often, but that song uh, <laughs> comes to my mind. But but how do you take Mabubani's, how do I say, challenge, mm. and how do I say, collide that with the desire 
would almost call the vanity, the narcissism of a nation wanting to be emulated, irrespective of its performance. Yeah. Well, um, we need to step back uh, rather far here, right? Uh, uh, let me take a few minutes with it. Uh, first of all, there is the ever-present uh, presumption somewhere in our unconscious of, of America as a chosen, providentially favored nation. Um, uh, it's been noted by some of the better historians uh, after the after the American Revolution, uh, Americans really had no taste whatsoever for revolution anymore because they had theirs and they have it right, and we've got it right, and that's all we need to know right now. If we have it right, then we better pass the word on, uh, you know, torchbearer of the world. Uh, lighting the way and so on and so forth right so that's that's deep within us as a people uh, also uh i've been interested for some time to thinking about how america was settled you know uh the settlers they didn't really have a lot of time to think things over if they needed to build a corduroy road to get a half a mile further into the wilderness, that was the job. Uh, and from that, I think, has uh, uh, come down to us uh, a, a very strong preoccupation with method. Americans are interested in how. They're not really all that interested in why. Uh, you know, the why of it, we know about all that. The why of it is we are the new world, and um, and all and all those questions are resolved, right? Commager pointed out in his wonderful book, The American Mind, America has never produced a first-rate philosopher, with the possible exception of Emerson. Right? So we're all about method. If you go to a dinner party or a cocktail party or something, listen to the conversation. It's always about how to do something, right? <laughs> it's really very amusing. And the first thing you ask, the first thing somebody asks you at a cocktail party, how'd you get here? Did you take, did you take the I-95 bridge? Right. Uh, um, it's how, right? Method, technique, right? Um, and it, this computes down. Uh, as um, a givenness to technocratic solutions to all problems. And once we begin to dedicate ourselves to technocratic solutions to all problems, we begin to lose, we, we want to impose them on, on the rest of the world, uh, and at the same time lose all sight of culture, history, political traditions, uh, in some, the, the humanity, what makes other people human, their aspirations and so forth. None of that matters here. You know, this is what shock therapy and all that was about, unless I read it wrongly. Um, uh, and, and this is why we, we, we're not a match with, uh, we're not a match with the world around us, you know. Uh, the world around us, um, uh, as I mentioned in one of the commentaries that brought us together, um, I find its roots in the so-called independence era in the 50s and 60s. But once again, the Cold War over, uh, the world is a great field of aspiration. Uh, and um, we can't we can't hear these aspirations. They don't fit with us, because nobody should aspire to anything more than what we have mastered. And here is the how of it. Here's how you do it, right? We're ahistorical that way, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I sense, from what you're saying, the unmindfulness about why hmm. is... <laughs> dangerous why what rob 
why you do something as opposed to how you do something. In other words, yeah. if you're if you're I'm being facetious, but if you're driving off the end of the dock, as long as you manage your car well and you just go into the ocean mm. and the car sinks, that's okay because you you drove skillfully, but you didn't yeah. choose where to drive to. Or why you, know you want book, your car to go into the water? I mean, you, you know that book, "The Promise of American Life." Uh, who wrote that? Crowley. Mm -hmm. Herbert Crowley, right? Yeah, yeah. He makes a distinction in the early pages. Right? He just a passing thing, but it's always stayed with me. Right? We're a nation of destiny. If you're a nation of destiny, you don't have to ask any why questions. Uh, the higher powers are guiding you. Yeah, it's all all resolved. <laughs> right, we're a nation of destiny, and we must become a nation of purpose. The difference between a nation of destiny and a nation of purpose is vast. When you have purpose, you have things to do. You're very cognizant of the why, right? In in Greek terms, techne and telos. The what are you working for? What's your North Star? What's your intent? Right. Uh, um, uh, and and this is a transition we need to make. We need to re-reckon ourselves uh, as uh, not a not a people with a destiny, but a people with a purpose. Then we can start saying, "And this is our purpose. And this is why it is our purpose. This is our telos. This is our." Uh, end point. This is what we strive for, right? Um, uh, you know, purpose and destiny. Let me, let me uh, shift focus. I, I think our exploration of this side of the ocean, whether it's Pacific or Atlantic, is important. But I'd like, because it's not something I'm particularly familiar with, and I know you are, I'd like to take us across to how Vladimir Putin is feeling and acting. And why I say that is I start from uh, my wife co-founded an organization called the per Perception Institute, which studied the regions of the brain, mind science, and how to heal social and racial animosity. That's an interesting proposition, yeah. And, and the punchline I'll, I'll just use, uh, I think it's a fascinating body of work, but the punchline I'll use is, when you shame somebody or when you threaten somebody, it makes it worse. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at Putin sitting on top of 6,000 nuclear weapons, according to the newspapers. They I'm have 6,000, we have 5,600. Yep. Yeah. And I'm looking at the fear all around the earth and the pandemic and other contexts, climate change on the horizon, but this coming on to center stage. I'm looking at how, and, and curious to ask you what he must be feeling like about how, which you might call, the world has and the American-led world has and is imposing upon him. If you were his right-hand strategist, how would, how would you advise him to be behaving in how does that differ from how he is behaving? Uh, the other day, John Pilger, the Australian British journalist, uh, sent me a map, a map of NATO accession by color, right? Pre 1997, post 1997. There's nothing in that map we don't already know. But if you look at it, it is a very effectively graphic. Uh, image of how Russia feels, right? There are only two nations left uh, on the whole of Russia's western border that aren't NATO, Belarus and Ukraine. Last summer, we tried a color revolution in Belarus. It didn't work out. But that's what that business last summer was all about, right? Uh, I looked at this map and I said, wow, Lukashenko, I don't really know a great deal about Lukashenko. He may not be a very nice piece of work, 
but Vladimir Putin is going to be his friend. <laughs> That's just based on the map. Uh, and, um, and Ukraine, just below it, th that tells you what you need to know, or it's a big, it, it starts you on the story of what, of how Vladimir Putin sees things. Um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the topography has something to do with this. There's a very great deal of flat land between, uh, between the Russian border and whatever river uh, marks out the, the rest, the Elbe or something, right? Uh, um, uh, very easily invaded history. Uh, history uh, is the, the campaigns eastward to Russia. We all know them. Uh, that's part of it. What, what, what I would do differently than Putin you know, I did. I I know very. I, I'm pretty confident this uh, uh, this move he made into Ukraine was hugely. He was very reluctant about it. People who watched him speak, people who are familiar with him, are Russia watchers, uh, noted he was almost grief stricken as he gave that speech announcing what he was going to do, what Russia was going to do. Uh, this comes at the end of, uh, uh, depending on how you want to count, um, 30 years of constant movement uh, eastward. And part of that are all sorts of covert operations we don't even know anything about right uh um i i'm not sure i would have done anything differently i i, I think uh putin made it very clear he said certain things in that speech i think we are well to take notice of and one of them is um on a couple of occasions uh we i don't have a right not to do this it, it, it is my obligation to do this. It is my obligation to our country and our people to do this. Uh, uh, whether we object to that or not, we, we really need to get our, uh, we, we really need to understand what he meant there, right? Again, go back to the map, right? Uh, if, if Ukraine or Belarus went into NATO, those frontiers would be a constant mess of incursions and sabotage and who knows what all, right? Uh, they would be very frayed borders. He can't have that. He can't have that, right? Uh, the popular trope now is Putin the madman. We can't understand him. He's lost his grip, right? Uh, this doesn't do. It simply doesn't do. Whatever you think of Putin, he has proven many, many times over that he is a, an accomplished statesman with uh, a, a very sound grasp of history. Right? Uh, uh, that's not an advertisement for Putin. These are just facts, right? You can, you can, you can hate Putin and still understand those two facts, right? Yeah. Uh, so, it's interesting uh, to me because the portrait that's painted to me as a consumer of a baseline American media hmm. would never have acknowledged that dimension of him. You, I mean, yeah. you're seeing beyond what you might call the propagandistic wall that is the mainstream legitimization in the United I, States. I, yeah, I, I can't cut my clothes to the fashion of the times, as Lillian Hellman once said. Right? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I am sorry that, that these points are so unpopular. That has nothing to do with whether or not I'm going to articulate them. I think this is exactly what I mean, meant earlier, when I said it is imperative upon us as a people, uh, as a nation state, uh, as as properly professional diplomats and statesmen, to develop the capacity to see 
how the world looks from behind the eyes of other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what we are getting now is wall-to-wall -wall resistance to this, right? If you read the social media and so on and so forth, it is a major transgression now to express any understanding, I'm leaving out the word sympathy, to, re to express any even rudimentary understanding of why Putin is acting the way uh, he is. I prefer to say Russia. I don't like this personalization of everything, right? Uh, <clears throat> Putin the madman, I'm sorry, it's too flimsy. It's too silly, right? Uh, NATO has, this has nothing to do with NATO expansion eastward. That's another one you're hearing now. First of all, it's patently, patently false. But beyond that, it is one of the ways we are totally resistant to seeing this question from the other side's point of view. So in essence, what we are fed is a vision of us resisting his aggression as in contrast with his resisting NATO and Western and US-led aggression. History deep and near, chronology since the 90s, and certainly since 2014, the coup, causality and responsibility, we can't leave these things out and pretend to understand this, this question, this crisis. And that's exactly what we're doing, leaving it all out. Remember, um, Richard Pearl, um, intellectual ornament for the George W. administration, right? After the attacks in 2001, he came up with this term, decontextualization. Remember that term? I, I remember Can hearing it. I, I, I don't yeah. remember it in the context. His, his, his immortal observation was, we must not try to understand the terrorists. Any attempt to understand them is, is amounts to support for them. I think he, he augmented the thought with the, this is a crime and nothing more, and it should be treated as a crime. Yesterday, I saw some things on Twitter that essentially were saying, uh, we can't afford to tolerate this negotiation between the Ukraine and Russia right now. They said uh, that. It was a Twitter article and, and another uh, a person who I follow replied and said, what are you telling us? That it was a journalist, I believe, with CNN or somebody that had made this statement. And my friend's reply was, what are you telling us? You mean we have to go to nuclear war now? Like, what, what are you talking about? And then there was a whole discussion following my friend's reaction about how don't don't you understand how aggressive these people are being and it's almost like you know in the old uh, adage of game theory there was a thing called the chain store paradox let's say you're macy's in new york somebody yeah. opens a little shop you don't crush them because they don't matter but then 20 other shops open and all of a sudden macy's is on defense everybody undercutting their prices so you got to go crush every little thing so that as long as you look tough, you've deterred everybody from exploring. And, uh, and that kind yeah. of sense that we've got to be super tough right now, where what you might call the backstop is nuclear exchange in the context of what we call mutual assured destruction, is quite daunting. How, how far do you want to provoke a nuclear reaction? I, I don't I, I do I don't know that much like I said that's part of why I invite you on because I don't quite understand but I feel like things are out of control they're spiraling yeah. out of control and where where is the healing going to be found what was Putin saying when he let it be known the other day a couple of days ago 
that he had authorized the nuclear deterrence programs in Russia, mm -hmm. airborne, seaborne, landborne, uh, to assume uh, a status of standby alert. I gather it's a low. It's a it's a low status. It's not one minute to midnight. Uh, what was he trying to say there? It was a shocking statement, of course, right? Uh, I think what he was trying to say there was, look, I drew the line. You saw the line. There was nothing too complicated about my red line. And you crossed it. And I, I, I think Putin, this goes to the context of the Putin Xi statement on February 4th, right? I think Putin sees this as a, as a moment to really clean things up and begin constructing a world order of the type Stanley Hoffman was writing about 44 years ago, right? I, I think he sees this in very large terms. Um, and that's what I think he meant to convey when he mentioned the d deterrence, uh, the uh, standby alert, right? They use the term deterrence. Implicit in that is we're not doing this first, but we're ready for you. Right. Uh, so I think he sees this as a big moment, capital B, capital M, right, uh, um, uh, uh, of of historic ge geopolitical consequence. And in the columns that brought us here, uh, that's my running theme. We are living through a, uh, we are living through a passage of very significant history. As I mentioned in one of them, it's very hard to understand one's present moment as as history because you're inside it looking out you can't really you know you just see what's going on around you the tick tock of events and so forth right uh, i think this is a moment where we need to step quite far back and recognize that we are in uh, a moment of a, a very great historical significance so that we can participate in it and respond to it uh, adequately. A couple of sentences from the joint statement, uh, the Xi-Putin statement, which which I, I, I think is, it's, I, I, I urge that we consider this statement in the context of the Ukraine crisis. The Ukraine crisis is in a certain way, a subset of what they're talking about in this document on the on international relations entering a new era. That's part of the mile long title of the document. Right uh, today, the world is going through momentous changes, and humanity is entering a new era of rapid development and profound transformation. A couple of sentences later, a trend has emerged toward redistribution of power in the world. Some actors representing but the minority on the international scale continue to advocate unilateral approaches to addressing international issues. They're talking big thoughts here, right? Um, and uh, as one might have predicted, uh, the administration has had virtually nothing to say about this statement. Um, and uh, the New York Times, predictably enough, sort of uh, purported to flick it off the table. Uh, as as nothing, I I think it would be hard to overstate the importance of it, and I mention it here. Uh, whether you want to go into it or not is up to you, Rob. But uh, I mention it here because it gives an idea of the let's say the 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 scale of President Putin's thinking, the 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 significance he reads into this moment, right. Uh, in all honesty, I, you know, I'm not suggesting I hold a great candle for Vladimir Putin. I'm not that critical. I'm not as critical of him as others, right? Uh, um, uh, but uh, 
it, it, in all honesty, in the interest of of a new kind of world order, I want him to succeed. I want him to get NATO to back off the way George Kennan, uh, Kissinger, uh, and uh, the current Burns, the, William Burns, the current director of the CIA, advised, cut it out. Uh, this would be good for all of us. There are a couple of unpopular ideas for, for you, Rambo. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really I'm stirred here because that portion that you read from the joint statement seems like wise, empathetic, insightful people appealing for mankind in a, a, a excuse my name, Robert Johnson at the crossroads. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but I'm good. seeing but I'm seeing a very um, an interesting element, which is why I brought up the Perception Institute. Defining yourself with your military nuclear arsenal is igniting the fear on the other side. And, yeah. it, and it may contribute to making a frightened America on the one level more complicit in this aggressive agenda and number two, and this is what bothers me even more, it may ignite within the Biden White House a fear that if they're not tough, the population is going to migrate to more protection, meaning the Republican side in the next election. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's being triggered. I can feel that, and this has been very valuable, the depth of what you have brought from that joint statement and from your way of seeing this deep geopolitical history, both in Asia and, and in Europe, and, and that there is a, what you might call humane basis for the stand that Putin is taking. But I am concerned about how we de-escalate the boldness and the toughness on both sides to create the harmony that allows us to march down the road that yeah. you would like to see. Bringing nuclear considerations into this was, you have to reckon that as a bad move, right? Uh, I, I think the point I made earlier as to what the Kremlin meant to say with that stands, it could have been made uh, more artfully, no question of that. The, the, you know, the the nuclear the the nuclear danger is just too dreadful to put anywhere near the table, right? Uh, parenthetically, apparently, uh, uh, he was responding to comments uh, the British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss was making. She's got about as much qualification for standing as Brit Britain's foreign secretary as my local librarian. Uh, she's completely over her head, right? Uh, makes one idiotic statement after another, which is quite dangerous, right? Um, you know, uh, I find I find the statement regrettable, and and uh, I think you may be right. It uh, it may advance antagonisms rather than de-escalate them, you know. But, you know, it's remarkable, Rob, in the context we were exploring earlier, the quality of American statesmen and stateswomen, Liz Truss, Foreign Secretary, Antony Blinken, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, uh, you know they're they're just not up to the job, right? Uh, Lavrov uh, is uh, once again uh, he's a very accomplished diplomat, right? Uh, while um, while uh, Javad Zarif was serving as Iranian uh, FM, I thought Lavrov and Zarif were were uh, among the most professional statesmen and active. You know, and going back to what we were saying earlier, we 
we've had no need for diplomacy or expertise. So, um, and um, this is what you get, amateurs, right? And I've always, I've, I've remarked from the beginning that Blinken and um, Sullivan have served their entire careers in advisory roles, right? They've been advisors on Capitol Hill and the State Department and so on, right? Uh, Biden put them in executive positions, a, a, a radical overpromotion. Hmm. And had they had in the field experience in other countries where their depth of awareness of, say, China or Japan or Russia, uh, in other words, being advisors on Capitol Hill about something afar is different than living in the fabric of that place afar and bringing that insight back home. Look at Jake Sullivan's CV. He doesn't know anything about China. I don't think Blinken does either. Right? Blinken surprised me. He's a superb education, right? Born in America, his wife, his mother moved to Paris, spent his high school years in the French lycée, totally bilingual, a mm. corporate lawyer in New York, and then in Paris, you know, a very worldly fellow. Uh, he surprised me. His, his, his lack of sophistication, his, his habit of repeating uh, entries in some American catechism uh, about human rights and democracy. Mm. Um, it's interesting because yeah. people like Ernest Hemingway used to write that you, when you're going to be most creative is when you go to a, a land that's not what you might call where you're unfamiliar, where your customs and unconscious habits and so forth are uh, not abided by. In, in other words, you no longer yeah. feel like you can dance and be part of the tribe now you become yeah. creative. Now you start to notice. Now you become yourself. And so yeah. those people who have that international experience are often deep from right. the way they've been challenged to be themselves. And That's uh, right. And, That's why Blinken surprised me a bit. Yeah. You know. But you talked about Hoffman earlier. He had come from France, as I remember. Yeah. Well, he was Austrian-born. Uh, his family moved to Paris. They moved to New Year, they must have had money, right? Uh, and um, his uh, his mother took him to the south of France uh, two days before the Germans uh, took Paris. Uh, after the war, he resumed his education in Paris. Uh, one of the Grand École, I think. I don't. I don't remember which one. Um, uh, and then he crossed the ocean in fifty odd years. Uh, teaching at Harvard. It all showed. I mean, you know, he was a very worldly fellow. I love what he said. I mentioned it in this column. I love what he said toward the end of his career when he returned to European studies uh, after many, many years uh, on American foreign policy. He said, you know, after a time denouncing the same old repeated mistakes is no longer any fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, well, I have to. That, how would I say? It feels a little bit like resignation, but but I. How would I say? If you can redeploy yourself and make a difference somewhere else, maybe that's just smart. He uh, made a great uh, contribution to. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. That was that was a modest uh, statement, probably. Uh, underestimating yeah. the impact that he had on, yeah. on people like yeah. you and me and others. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, without any doubt. Right? Yeah. So you have an, a forthcoming book. Tell me just a little bit foreshadowing because I want to set us up for making the next chapter when that book is released. Okay, thank you, Rob. Well, the last one, the, the last one was called Time No Longer. Yale put it out. It's still in print. Um, Americans after the American century, right? Uh, Kind of a study of um, of where we were after two thousand and one, right? and, and uh, at, at that time, I I said uh, I argued that America had twenty five years, counting from two thousand and one, 
the book came out 2013, I think. America had 25 years, counting from 2001, uh, to decide whether it was going to um, move into a new position in the world relative to the in, to other nations with imagination and creativity and guts, as we were saying earlier, or messily and violently. Well, we've chosen the latter path. Uh, that's one way of looking at Ukraine, in fact. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I want to write any more books like that. This new one... Um, is called The Journalist and His Shadow. Um, the title comes from a passage in um, Nietzsche's The the Wanderer and His Shadow, right? Uh, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of a genre bender. It's about the crisis in our press. Um, so it's in that way, analytic it's also history my argument is that the american press had a very bad cold war and never recovered from it uh, because it could never acknowledge its errors and that's why we're repeating every single one of them with shocking astonishing fidelity and it's memoir it's uh, my own uh, years uh, th through most of the period I'm writing about uh, as a professional, uh, an editor in New York, uh, uh, and then a correspondent uh, abroad, right? And e ending with my my years uh, as uh, what we're now calling an independent journalist, right? Um, uh, I clocked out of the mainstream uh in uh i don't know 2010 or so um been functioning as an independent journalist ever since and i make the argument that that's where the future lies the future lies with independent journalists who have a different re the core question is what is the relationship between journalism and power at, at the moment it's it's just the way it was during the Cold War, a very corrupted relationship. There's no independence. Any notion of a fourth estate is, that's, that's a dusty antique, right? Uh, um, and, and we have to restore that. Uh, and, and I think the restoration is going to be driven by independent media. So that's the book. The memoir is kind of a, gives some narrative uh, flow and force to it. Well, that's that's powerful. You're right at a cutting edge when the Institute for New Economic Thinking is contemplating how to make a difference. The notion of what I'll call educating versus educating citizens versus credentializing yes. as inputs to production and how that mm. matters to education, what people choose, how strong yeah. the body politic can be. It, it derives from, I have read years ago, Jane Jacobs' final book called Dark Age Ahead. And chapter three is called Credentializing one, Versus Educating. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass that on to you as a so matter of thanks. So she moved away to, from, she moved beyond urban studies and all that. Huh? That's correct. She was in Toronto and wrote this just fantastic book. It was released in 2004. But, she had a great uh, intellect. She had a great. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. And 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 her her humanity, the way her humanity informed her intellect, I think is is part of the reason she was so effective as a writer. Yeah, yeah, and you know, people like her. Uh, a friend of mine who's at Wayne State University in Detroit, where I grew up, Jerry Heron, who's written about universities and the myth of cultural decline. He wrote a book called After Culture about how media refracted and demonized the city of Detroit. And I used to say they divorced Detroit. They didn't rescue it. They didn't make it a part of the nation. Yeah. They told everybody the American dream is fine. Those people cause their own problems. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I think this, this realm that you're exploring vis-a-vis -vis journalism, like I've been exploring vis-a-vis -vis education, 
is about how healthy and how capable the body politic is of reacting in our own interest, our own collective common good interest, vis-a-vis some of the forces that we've been exploring today. I'm very eager to make the point, look, this may be a book about journalism, but it's a book that all of us need to be concerned with, right? Uh, uh, Because, um, you know, uh, I quote in one of the chapters, I quote Jefferson, this wonderful mo of his, he was writing back to a friend in America while he was serving as the minister in Paris, right? And he said, uh, if it came to a question of a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I would, without hesitation, choose the latter condition. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> and, and, and we don't. What we have now is government without newspapers because the relationship between the media um, and and political and and corporate power and the difference between those two is very hard to discern sometimes, right? Um, uh, Is 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 very diseased. It's it's uh, it's very it's direly bad. uh, quite corrupt, uh, and so in consequence, th- the the press s- serves uh, political power to uh, such a faithful extent that we effectively have government without newspapers. These these papers, uh, I know it sounds a bit extreme. I, I stand by the judgment. They're basically bulletin boards. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> Well, that's in part why I founded this podcast, that sensibility, and that's very much why I asked you to come and join me here today. The Bless light you, you shed on things, it reminded me of my namesake and his song, the first verse of Crossroads. I went down to the crossroads, fell down on my knees. I went down to the crossroads, fell down on my knees. Ask the Lord above, have mercy now. Save poor Bob, if you please. Well, <laughs> I'm using this bandwidth and these things to not just about right poor Bob, but poor poor America, poor yeah. world, because we are at a crossroads and you are shedding yeah. light on things. Yeah. And uh, I'm tempted to uh, bring up another song, Todd Rundgren. I saw the light in your eyes from the time we first met through our friend Marshall. There's a light within you, and I want to oh, both you, celebrate it and encourage it and encourage my young people who are defining meaning in their life and their career to take your example. So, uh, uh, one, if you're broadcasting to students, uh, one little shard of advice. Uh, look up the word discernment. The Jesuits have an excellent definition of this word. It means autonomous thinking. It means learning to think, to discern means to think for yourself and make your own judgments uh, free of the influences of others. Not to say you don't learn from others, but uh, um, uh, discernment. There's not enough of it. In my own courses, I teach it, right? Uh, whatever you're teaching, uh, to a certain extent, maybe you agree, you're teaching students how to think, right? Uh, uh, and um, uh, maybe your students want to look up that term. That's what they need. <laughs>